This planet looks terrifying. It is red, it is scorching hot, and it has nothing in terms of life or water. And this is all because of this huge red bright giant in the sky. This red giant one day is going to go supernova and create something called a neutron star. And as we come closer to this red giant, let's actually go out there and try to find a neutron star that we can investigate in more detail. Today we're going to be talking about the faith of certain neutron stars that end up becoming magnetars. Welcome to What the Math. <laughs> And what you're looking at right now is a neutron star. Now this might be a pulsar or it might be a magnetar. It's kind of hard to tell just based on the statistics we get in this game. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about what they are and why they're one of the more fascinating objects in the universe. I'm going to zoom out of here and you can see how bright it is. So this neutron star is actually very small, but it's also very, very dense. And if I actually try to land on this neutron star, I'll realize that it's actually a huge lensing effect and you can kind of see it on the border here. And that's because this is a very massive object that is also very, very dense. So just like a black hole, it creates this huge lensing effect where light is bent because of its mass. So let's go into Universe Sandbox 2 and try to recreate these beautiful objects and talk a little bit more about what they actually are. So after a supernova, usually a very large star, not like our sun, but something a lot larger, uh, will become or possibly become a, um, a neutron star. Now, some neutron stars become pulsars and we can actually see some of the pulsars in this game by going into the simulations and just clicking on this here, binary pulsar. So this is an example of what a pulsar is. So it's basically a neutron star that starts pulsating and sends out these signals. So it's sort of like um, a lighthouse. And I've done a video before where I've explained more about these particular objects. Um, and here's the thing though, some of them, or at least one in 10, will not only become pulsars, but they'll become something called magnetars. And what is the magnetar? Well, think of it as the most powerful magnet in the universe. It is so powerful that if you were to stand within a thousand kilometers of, of this object, so if I were to come closer to it, and if this was a magnetar, if I was this close to it, I would not be able to exist you would actually not survive and there's just no way you can even exist so close to it because the magnetic field here is so strong uh, that your uh, your actual atoms would start turning into these really really tiny cylinders and the electrons would be stripped from them so it's sort of like imagine your atoms becoming like tiny 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 long spaghetti and this is essentially what would happen to you if you came really close to it uh, if you move a little bit farther away, if you're about, uh, let's just say, like uh, 100,000 kilometers away or maybe 300,000 kilometers away, it's not as dangerous. Uh, the only thing that would happen is that you would probably lose um, all of your magnetic information. So things like credit cards, cell phones, hard drives would be completely wiped. But if you come closer to it, this is when it gets really dangerous. But these are not actually magnetars, these two are pulsars. So let's make a magnetar from scratch. We're going to go into a new simulation and we're just going to place a pulsar. So right here under stars, there's quite a lot of choices. All of these are pulsars. So let's just take something that's a little bit more massive. So maybe this one here. Um, and all of these are actually real pulsars we've already found. Uh, however, here in this particular simulation, it's not actually a pulsar just yet. Uh, for some unknown reason, it doesn't actually pulsate yet, even if you enable its magnetic field. Um, so it doesn't have any magnetic field here. We're going to give it magnetic field. So um, a real magnetar would have a magnetic field of something of something like this. So it's one followed by 11 zeros of Gauss, which is uh, one of the measurements of um, magnetic field. We're going to give it 11. So here we go. So a real magnetar would have a magnetic field of approximately one followed by 11 zeros of Tesla. Now Tesla is a measurement of magnetic field and this is 
the most powerful magnet possible. We're gonna decrease this just a little bit because those magnet, uh, those pulsars you just you've just uh, witnessed before, they had about uh, one followed by five zeros. So this was their magnetic field. Now to make this into an actual pulsar, I first have to. And here we go. As soon as I uh, enable realistic mode, it actually does turn into a pulsar. So right now it's not really pulsating as much. It's just sort of rotating. And we're going to make it pulsate by changing its motion. We're going to give it uh, a little bit of a wobble by going into materials and adding magnetic pole. Let's just say 40 degrees. And here we go. So this is a pulsar now that is going to be pulsating uh, actually a little bit slower. It's uh, maybe a little bit too slow. A, a, real, a more realistic pulsar will be doing this at least once per second, which means we're going to increase this to a second. There we go. So this is a more realistic pulsar right now. Uh, let's decrease our time a little bit. And so let's talk a little bit about, about this. So this right now is just a pulsar, but we're going to turn it into a magnetar. So the first time we've actually detected one was in 1979. And this was when uh, the Soviet Venera probe, uh, the probe that actually went to Venus, uh, was suddenly hit by a huge radioactive uh, burst of gamma rays and x-rays and it was so so big that it was it just drove scientists insane they didn't know what's happening uh, and not just this probe but actually a lot of uh, NASA probes as well like Helios 2 uh, the one that was orbiting the Sun at this time and Pioneer Venus Orbiter were also hit by this radiation field and nobody could understand what's going on and it was actually the most powerful uh, radioactive outburst out ever detected and later on someone hypothesized that it was probably from something like this from a pulsar that is essentially super magnetic now we're going to increase its magnetic field by 10 times and look what happens so this is not even that close uh, not even close to a real magnetar yet this is still about maybe a million times less strong but look at what happens its magnetic field increases dramatically and uh, just to give you an idea how far this is right now it's uh, a radius of about a thousand kilometers this is where it sort of has this really really powerful magnetic field okay let's zoom out a little bit and we're gonna do this again and we're gonna do this again and now let's make it actually realistic uh, in terms of what a real magnetar would have as a field so a real magnetar would have something like this. Now, just to show you the distances here, this this is six astronomical units. This is the distance of, uh, I guess, Uranus to the sun. And essentially, this is a huge sort of vortex that's being created by all of the magnetic stuff in there. Um, it's so big, as a matter of fact, that if there was a planet uh, somewhere here and it was hit by this by this stream of light which is not really light it's actually gamma rays and x-rays and all kinds of super highly energetic um, particles it would completely annihil annihilate anything on that planet and would most likely also scorch it completely destroy all of the atmosphere even after this millisecond and would probably leave that planet barren for forever uh, so this is a highly super energetic field. Now that outburst I talked about uh, that happened in 1979, we now know that it probably happened because of the supernova uh, around 3000 BC and it's somewhere close to the center of our galaxy. And this is actually the first magnetar we've ever detected, the first outburst from magnetar that we've ever detected. Um, as of now, we've detected at least three. Uh, there was one in 98 and there was another one in 2004 as well. And these were uh, just ridiculously powerful um, outbursts. And usually these are caused by something called a star quake on the surface of a magnetar. So when a magnetar gets the star quake, basically kind of like an earthquake, but you know, on a star, it releases huge amounts of energy. So, so huge as a matter of fact that if you were to receive that energy, you would be dead within milliseconds. Now, fortunately, magnetars don't actually live that long, or I guess maybe unfortunately, their life only lasts for about 10,000 years and then they become either pulsars or just neutron stars. But it's uh, now known that um, sometimes a pulsar can become a magnetar. So basically, it's reversible. They don't always stay magnetars, but they can come back to that state as again. 
Now we're gonna actually add a random terrestrial planet orbiting around Magnetar and we're gonna try to terraform it because why not? Even though it's ridiculously dangerous to live on this planet, we're going to do it because we can. So we're gonna place this planet somewhere right here and hopefully this will be terraformed. Oh, actually, hold on, this is too hot. Let's place it a little bit farther away. Let's put it right here. And this will hopefully be uh, terraformable. All right, I think I found a sweet spot at a distance of approximately 10 million kilometers away from the Magnetar. And let's actually name it something. Let's name it the Magnetar. This is going to be the Magnetar right here. And this is going to, be, this is called Sisichu. Sisichu. All right, so that's the name of the planet that we have right here. And this, we're going to try to terraform it, but before that, so let's, uh, let me just uh, show you the comparison of what uh, the magnetic field on our planet is in comparison to this magnetar. So the magnetic field on our planet is approximately this much. It's, it's about 0 0.005 Tesla. So if I were to show you how this looks, it sort of looks like this. Uh, and this is sort of the field created by this magnetic field on our planet. Now, this magnetar has a field of 1 followed by 11 zeros Tesla. So in other words, it's ridiculously more powerful. Uh, even the most powerful magnet on our planet is only one Tesla. It's about one Tesla. These are, they are, they're called neodymium-based rare earth magnets, and they're really powerful. They can even like levitate a frog if you put a frog on them. But nevertheless, uh, the magnetar is like a trillion times more powerful. All right, let's add some atmosphere to this planet, and we're also going to give it a little bit more water. Excellent. So now all we have to do is just wait a little bit until it uh, terraforms itself. And uh, meanwhile, I I'm pretty sure that if there was any possibility for life on this planet, it would be dead within milliseconds of that ray, this huge ray that's pulsating around us, hitting the planet. Uh, although maybe we if it's not hitting the planet, we might actually have life after all. Anyway, so um, one other thing about magnetars, which is really, really interesting, at least I find it interesting, is that as you come closer to them, as you actually come within uh, a few kilometers of them, strange things start to happen. For example, vacuum itself, the actual empty space, starts to become magnetic. In other words, uh, magnetar can create magnetism out of nothing. It's a very interesting phenomenon because it's something that is just incomprehensible. It's like, you know, you're creating something out of nothing. Uh, also, things like atoms become really deformed. They become really, really long and thin. Um, a lot of the uh, hydrogen that's inside the magnetar itself becomes really, really narrow. So the actual shape of atoms is very different. And so the actual shape of a magnetar might also be very, very unusual. It might not even be a sphere. And even the rays emitted from this magnetar, so things like X-rays and gamma rays, they start merging together, or sometimes they separate into two. So the powerful magnetic field actually has effect on even on the uh, X-rays and gamma rays that are being emitted from it. So there's some really crazy things that go on inside or very close to magnetar. And I think what goes on very close to magnetar or inside the magnetar is even crazier than what goes on in a black hole or close to a black hole, because Imagining an atom not as a collection of protons and neutrons, but as a really long spaghetti of protons and neutrons is kind of difficult, I think. And don't forget, they have no electrons left, so what keeps them together is unknown. Anyway, so let's see how this planet is doing. It's slowly warming up, it's already above zero degrees, and it looks like it's already terraformed. I think the temperature will go on to about maybe 25, 30 degrees Celsius because, because of the greenhouse effect. And we have atmosphere on it, we have clouds, we have liquid water, we have everything, including super deadly gamma rays from the magnetar that we're orbiting. But if you look at it though, it's so tiny, it's just a speck of light in the sky, so you might not even provide enough, uh, um, enough light for us, so this planet might be very dark, but it does provide enough heat and radiation, meaning that this is what, where the actual heat is coming from. But even with the magnetic uh, field that we have on this planet, which is right here, this will not be enough to protect us from anything. If I were to remove this right now, if I were to actually make this zero, you would notice that our planet would suddenly start losing mass because now it's being hit by all of these radioactive particles that are basically just stripping it of its own surface and atmosphere. So we're going to start losing atmosphere, we're going to start losing uh, actual materials from our planet and so on. So we do need to have a little bit of 
uh, magnetic field for us to at least survive and not lose all of this stuff. Although after about 10,000 years, it's very likely that this magnetar might not be as dangerous anymore, so we might be able to actually have life on this planet. But the problem is that if there is at least one of those so-called sunquakes or starquakes, if there is a star quake, the amount of energy released from this magnetar will be so large that uh, if there was anything on that planet, including atmosphere, it's going to be stripped completely and the planet might actually even evaporate. The energy might be so powerful that this planet might be no more because of the amount of energy that this magnetar releases. And anyway, so this is essentially what magnetars are and this is why they're so cool and why it's worth kind of looking into them more, a little bit more. I'm going to zoom out just to show you this pulsar and I'm going to slow down time just to show you how it pulsates every few seconds. And so uh, this is something that we can s definitely see in, in the sky. Um, we can detect these and we can actually see the pulsating parts of pulsars. And when it's a magnetar, the gamma rays are a lot stronger and we also get to see a lot of really powerful x-rays as well. So this is when we can kind of suspect that the pulsar might be also a magnetar. So like I said, these are the most powerful magnets in the universe and they are some of the cooler objects that you can find in space. We currently only know um, 21 and there's maybe three more that we might kind of confirm really soon. So there aren't that many, but that's because they, like I said, they only last for about 10,000 years. After 10,000 years, they go dormant, but uh, some pulsars may once again become magnetars. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, subscribe, like this video, and check out some of the other Universe Unboxed 2 videos I've posted online. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and game you later. Bye-bye.